Hey everybody, this is Perch. Uh, well, I think, when did I say this? Like uh, less than six months ago, I want to say that, that big layoffs were coming to Comixology. And, uh, you know, at this point, I've, I've got enough credibility calling these things, and not a lot of people disagreed. Uh, maybe people agreed for the wrong reasons, it's always possible, but, uh, but whatever. Uh, layoffs have hit Comixology, and, and it's important that I give you a little bit of context to this story, because I'm seeing some people reporting it wrong, or at least drawing some conclusions that aren't necessarily connected. So let, let's get to the very basics uh, right out the gate. So, and this is the most important thing to consider of all of it. Amazon, who owns Comixology, Comixology is a product of Amazon. Amazon is laying off 18,000 roles starting, well, basically now, uh, started January 18th. Uh, layoffs uh, began on Wednesday, and they are largely focused in kind of technology redundancy, which would probably be, you know, the better way to put it. Things like, uh, and, and it's worth kind of backing up for a second. Um, Amazon has taken a tech strategy. It's not an unusual one. Lots of people do. Um, where they basically build the same thing, or they allow multiple teams to build the same thing. Now, why would they do that? Well, if they're uncertain about their tech direction or uncertain about some of the goals, Amazon finds that, you know, the race to speed of having multiple groups, you know, kind of develop the same technology is a, is a good strategy. If you've, if you've got a lot of money, it, it basically allows you to take multiple shots on goal. You've heard me say this before. It's, a, it's, it's basically you take multiple bets, um, not worry about the details. So one of the places you get really wound up in technology is if you try and consider everyone's use case. And, and an example of this would be, well, you take Amazon and you say, all right, we want to sell books and we want to sell groceries and we want to sell, you know, clothing and we want to sell video games. And so, you know, in order to build this, we're going to have to get requirements from all those different groups. So, you, you know, the poor product manager sitting there going, all right, so I got to figure out how to make the feature that enables, you know, grocery sales where there may be a kind of temperature component and a freshness component. All right, I got to make that reconcile somehow with uh, the video game unit that doesn't care about any of those things. But uh, you need to do pre-orders over there. You can't you should you can't pre-order food, but you can pre-order a video game. So anyway, uh, when you try and combine all these requirements together, it's what often creates bad software because you're it's death by a thousand cuts is kind of the term. It's it's where you get so many different requirements that you can't make progress because you're trying to accommodate everyone. You build something for everyone, which winds up being for no one. So a pretty decent strategy is to basically let these different divisions build their own thing and worry about harmonizing it later. And yes, you do incur more costs. You incur what they call tech debt, usually in that world. And the uh, integration spend is, you know, as sizable as an effort. But you're doing so educated. You're doing so having taken something to market. You know what's going to break and what's going to succeed. You know what features really matter and don't based on what customers are buying or using. And so, you know, you, you, you then eliminate the redundancies. A lot of companies do this. Amazon has definitely taken the strategy. Many of the layoffs from my read come into at least, you know, that, that is a big piece of it. It's, it's where you had tech overlap. Now you're bringing things together. But... Um, many staffers are affected at Comixology. So this is a little bit different. Comixology didn't have a multiple shots on goal approach other than Amazon was dipping its toe to say, do we want to be a storefront for comics? And when they kind of brought it into the company, they integrated several, you know, redundant pieces around billing and other things already. And, uh, and now, you know, we're, we're here. So what is, what is going on? Well, um, Here's where it's it's unclear. It basically, uh, generally speaking, if you are getting a severance package from Amazon, which all these people are, they're uh, signing an NDA. Basically, they can't necessarily talk about the terms of their agreement. Um, and But we do know that at least layoffs, some are happening immediately, some are happening in a few months, and some are further in the year. Now, why do you draw it out like that? Well, simple. Some roles you deem, you know, you don't need to, you don't need it all. Some roles you like the person, but you don't need that position anymore. So you basically give that person three months to kind of look around the company, try and find something else. You don't have a, an easy spot for them to slide into. So you, you basically delay it, give them a chance to get picked up somewhere. And in some cases, you have people who are doing things that you still want them doing work for. So you, you need that work to continue for about six months until it's fully automated or whatever it happens to be. 
So uh, here is, uh, the, you know, the, the quote is the exact number of impacted workers is unclear, but workers who did speak under, you know, the clause of, you know, anonymity, um, basically said that it is a significant number of people working on the platform before the end of the year. And uh, some people are throwing out a number like 95% of the staff, which basically would be everybody in, in, all, in all intents. Um, Comixology has had a, a very troubled last year or two. Uh, the, the product uh, updated itself into a completely unusable clusterfuck uh, and then, you know, sort of repaired some of that. But... Um, you know, uh, it, it is uh, basically the service, which does house a lot of things, uh, certainly products from the publishers, uh, graphic novels, etc., and also the Comixology Originals line. Um, it's, it has not been successful. Now, I think it's been, so pardon, let me, let me rephrase that. I think the effort has probably been successful for, you know, I, I'm speculating here, but people like Scott Snyder who got a good deal and some of the creators that came with him to do those originals, I think it was probably a very good deal he got. But in terms of actually, you know, selling comics, getting them out to the market, getting a lot of kind of attention for those books, um, you know, I, 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 I well, I mean, it, it, it hasn't been a success. It hasn't been what Amazon hoped it would be. The, the originals line from the beginning, and keep in mind, Comixology has been doing originals for a while now. Um, they've never been able to get it to take off. It always seems disconnected from the digital and the print, even though in many cases it's not. They have a print partner lined up, but it, it feels that way to readers. And I think this is probably the, the major flaw in comiXology and their approach here is that the strategy nobody could quite understand or explain well. If you're in Amazon or you have a deal, you know, I, I, I suspect if you sat down with Scott Snyder, he'd be able to explain to you really well what's going on and You'd walk away from that conversation going, oh, okay, I get it. But in order to have a successful strategy for a company like this, you need to be able to understand it without Scott Snyder coming over to your house and explaining it to you. It needs to be just obvious and apparent. And with, uh, with all their efforts here, it wasn't. It, they never figured out the magic bullet of uh, marketing and, and, and just how to explain what it is they were doing. Is there a print version? There is. Okay, so why did most people think there wasn't? You know, it, it existed. At some point, you could say, well, the readers are dumb, but, you know, that's a cop-out. You didn't communicate the message properly. And when I say you, I mean Amazon. I don't mean Snyder. I don't mean the artist he worked with. I, don't, I mean, Amazon Comixology never sold people on the value of the platform and what it could do for, for you. I also think, um, in general... I think Comixology was hamstrung by the publishers and their reliance on the direct market. And what I mean by that is, you know, publishers would put titles into Amazon to sell, but the price was way too high because they were trying to align with the print version. Nobody wants to pay, you know, same dollar amount for, you know, a digital only copy. It just doesn't add up. It wasn't a good value proposition. Everybody thought they were being stolen from, basically. So it, that, that in and of itself is a, it was a crippling problem. The business model was wrong. And this had, since the publishers did Comixology zero favors by strapping them with a model that didn't fit, you know, their storefront in the slightest. Uh, that, that is, uh, I mean, that, that's a major, major problem and, a pro and an issue with the service. The other problem is the publishers were only half interested in, in, cultivating and evolving that platform in the first place. When I say half interested, maybe I'd be more like, you know, a 10th interested because number one, they were busy trying to cultivate their own, you know, Marvel unlimited packages and platforms. So arguably, you know, in a very weird and twisted way, they could look at comiXology as a competitor to themselves. So, you know, they only half ass supported it. But then in addition, there's a lot of people inside Marvel and DC who don't support digital at all who just like, well, people will never read a digital copy. They always want print. Now, you as a customer may have that view and, you know, more power to you. It's your dollar. It's your right. But as a publisher, it really isn't acceptable for you to have that view. It's, it's not okay if you are the publisher and you're trying to grow your market and you're wandering around going, well, nobody's really going to support digital. Well, that, okay, 
you, you, you need to be removed from your job and somebody else needs to come in. It's your job as the publisher to build markets and build channel. It is not your job to, you know, dictate or decide kind of in your own little vacuum uh, if you, you know, if this platform is good or not. The market decides. The customer decides. It's your job to make it as attractive as possible. When you come in in the morning, you should be trying to basically sell comics every fucking place you can. That is your goal. If you are making public statements or you're making even internal statements to your staff going, yeah, but I don't think digital is ever going to take off. Well, guess what? It won't. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You half-ass it. And that's exactly what uh, the digital strategy at the big two looks like most of the time. And you get nowhere. So I think comiXology was dealt a bad hand. They had a bad UI and they made it worse. They never properly got behind the service in general. I think when it was consumed by Amazon and you could easily make the argument, and I think you'd be right, why should Amazon put effort and money behind them? They're, they're a multi-billion dollar business dealing with much, much bigger fish. If, if Amazon corporate is spending more than 0.05% of their mental energy on comiXology, they're, they're literally costing themselves money. So, you know, they, they didn't get behind the service. They never found somebody, you know, they toyed around with a couple of people who, wrote, who ran it. I don't think at any point you really had anybody who was, uh, you know, really invested quite bluntly. I, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's, you know, I'm sure that's insulting some people who I'm sure worked very, very hard on some of this stuff. But I'm sorry, from the outside looking in, that's one of the first things they tell you about business. It's not about you. It's about how you're perceived. Now, you know, when you go home and you're with your family and your kids and everything, then yeah, it's totally about you and, and you matter. And, and of course, but when you're a company, fair or unfair, how the market perceives you is what you're going to live with. So you can try and adjust the way people see you. But if you enter into it from a position of I'm perfect and I'm, I'm using that quote, I, some of the people I some of the people I talked to at Comixology years ago. Um, they had the viewpoint of there is nothing we can improve upon. We are perfect. I mean, okay, don't think so. So it, it, it is a shame. Um, it's it's a big cut. I think for all intents and purposes, uh, you could kind of say goodbye to any serious digital effort now. Um, you know, everybody's going to get spooked and pulled back. If you have, you know, a couple million dollars, that would absolutely be the time to invest it and build a digital platform and say, and just take over because the, suddenly the world is wide open to you. But again, I, I think, you know, you have to contend with that problem at Amazon and Amazon's a huge company. They could never contend with it. So consider this, Amazon, as big and powerful as they are, still couldn't get the publisher to play ball in a reasonable way. Marvel and DC, which are infinitely smaller, than uh, than Amazon and Comixology, they never came with a compelling you know reason. So if you're gonna if you're gonna set up a digital platform, just know that whatever you invent and whatever you think about, the publishers are still gonna want to shuttle four ninety five books down to your platform, and that's that's what you're trying to make money off of. Good luck. Anyway, it's um, it's interesting. I. Uh, I was there for the very, very early original days of Comixology and uh, knew some of the people there and, and kind of how it was being constructed. And I, I, sad to say, I think a lot of what's happened today is, is, was, was fairly predictable. Uh, they, they, it never became disruptive. And I think for a digital platform and something along those lines, um, it ha that's, that's kind of the nut you got to crack. It needs to be disruptive. This, uh, whatever you're doing in this space, needs to be, you know, a transformation of where it is today. If you go into it, just trying to kind of passively, mildly make a couple changes, you're going to fail. It won't work. Anyway, there you go. Thanks for listening.